Oh, fantastic. Uh, good to see you all this morning. Uh, welcome to you. If uh, you're new with us or you're a regular, we're so glad that you're here. We're just about a month away from the first day of spring, huh? Man, I am so, so looking forward to that and uh, just anticipating the sunshine again. It's uh, been so good uh, just to worship with you today. And if you're new with us, we welcome you. Glad that you're here. So we're in this series called Who's Your One, as you saw. And we're talking about uh, our faith. And as a church, what is the role of a Christian in sharing faith? And how do we do that? How can we get bolder and uh, braver? Last, last time, TJ talked about um, how that Jesus went personal that he didn't just leave it at the shallow level and left a model for us that when we are uh, building relationships with people that God really wants us to go personal. Uh, when we talk about who's your one and we talk about going public with faith, I sometimes feel the tension in myself, and I'm sure that some of you do as Jesus followers, that you don't want to be that guy or that girl. Like the guy who uh, said, hey, let's go to lunch. I hadn't seen him in a long time. He took me to lunch, and I thought, well, this is fun to hang out with this guy. I haven't seen him in a long time, and we're catching up. And then about halfway through the meal, he said, would you like to know how to make some more money? <laughs> and I realized that he had something to sell me, and it was an uh, overpriced carbon water filter. And he, I had to see this video of how uh, water has all these squiggly things in it. And can you believe that you're drinking this? And uh, these are all the diseases that, uh, that people have because they drink regular water. But you can drink purified water, and it's going to change your life. And then you can sell these overpriced carbon filters and make lots of money. Guess what? I bought one of those overpriced carbon filters, <laughs> but I didn't sell any. Uh, I just didn't have the, the you-know-what to, to do that. And, and I don't want to be that person that feels like I'm manipulating relationships. That came up in my small group last week where we were talking about learning people's names and getting personal, and then somebody said, doesn't that feel like manipulation, like you're getting to know somebody so that then you can slip in the gospel? And is, is that what we're talking about? And how is it that Jesus calls us to do this as followers to go public with our faith, but we don't want to be that person that, that's like a manipulator? And why is it so important? because there's a lot at stake. My friends, as we're sitting here this morning and some of you are fearful about the world, uh, you're, you're maybe like me, you, you think, man, you know, now marijuana is legal in so many places and people are driving and using heavy equipment and then yikes, you know, you think about who in this next lane may be high or something and you can be fearful. You can be fearful about uh, growing crime statistics or people on heroin. And uh, you just say, man, this world is just going down the tubes. And then there's this political divide in our land. And, and we get amped up and worried about who's going to win the election. And will it be your guy or my guy and, or my gal or your gal? And you, we get amped up about those sorts of things. And that can seem like it's the most important thing. But in the context of all that is the reality that the world is broken and that the secular solution is not really working for the world. And many people who claim to be free and claim to be having the life that they've always wanted, but if you just dig a little bit beneath the surface past the past the cars and past the big house and past the college education and you dig in and you find out that on the empty, on, on the inside it's just empty and people's soul and it's like their soul is eaten out and there's no life on the inside. Uh, this is actually good news for Christians because we're able to, to, to help share with people that what you're doing is not really working and that Jesus really is a solution for your life. But while we're sitting here this morning and, and thinking about our faith, it's important for us to realize that false worldviews don't just lead to false stories. They lead to an empty eternity, the wrong eternity. And this is why it's so important for followers of Jesus to actually go public with their faith because we have the solution. 
And while the world thinks that they do know the answers, that on the inside, it's, there, many of them are just empty. Uh, there's a quote by Neil Postman, who is a secular professor at Columbia University. And he writes this, he says, to the question, how did it all begin? Science answers, probably by an accident. To the question, how will it all end? Science answers, probably by an accident. And to many people, the accidental life is not worth living. That's the reality. And why is the biggest selling book of all time, besides the Bible, the purpose driven life? Here's why it's because science is wonderful, science answers many things. Uh, we love scientists, we love engineers, we think it's a great field, but it cannot answer the question, why am I here? What is the purpose for my life? What's the reason for my existence? And science can answer a lot of things about how life works, but it can't answer the deeper questions of life. Now, if you're an unbeliever here this morning, I want you to relax, I want you to know that you're among friends. And maybe just as we talk about this this morning, you'll see the reason why uh, we do believe it's important to share our faith. And we're going to look at a lady who was empty on the inside and how Jesus met her where she was. I'd love for you to get your Bibles, to get your phone, pull this up on uh, some kind of device and follow along with me. Okay? You with me today? All right. John chapter 4. And... Uh, this is a story about a woman at a well. Some of you have heard this story. We're going to read a little bit of it, and, uh, and then we'll talk about it. So it says here in John chapter 4 that Jesus was headed toward Jerusalem, and he has to go through Samaria. And while he's going through Samaria, he stops at a well. And it says in verse 7, a woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria, for Jews have no dealings with Samaritans? So Jesus crosses several lines here. First of all, he's crossing the line of Samaria, which was not the place where Jewish people went. It was the place of half-breeds. It was the place where pagans had intermixed and intermingled with God's people, the Hebrews, and created this half-breed race, as they called them, Samaritans. And Jesus is in this place that's kind of a no-no place for Hebrew people. He's standing there talking at the well to a woman, which was another line that many Hebrew men did not cross because they weren't supposed to talk to women. It was a cultural thing. And not only was he talking to a woman, he was talking to a woman that had a history that we're going to learn about that even made it a reason why she's coming to the well in the middle of the day. People with good news cross dividing lines. It's just like with uh, the I-70 corridor that some people who never were Kansas City Chiefs fans have suddenly now become Chiefs fans. And we're also friendly with people who are Chiefs fans. There was a day that that wasn't the case. And suddenly we're friends. Why? Because we share good news. We share something that is in common. We have a common enemy now. It's called Tom Brady and the New England Patriots. <laughs> so it didn't matter during the Super Bowl uh, whether you were from St. Louis or Kansas City because we share this thing in common. We both are glad that Tom Brady was not in the Super Bowl. Can I get a witness today? Okay, so some of you are like, whatever. Well, this is where it begins with Jesus, is that he crosses a line that is socially unacceptable, but he does it because he has something good to share. That when you have good news, that you 
cross those dividing lines. Now, just like we did, we saw last week that Jesus crossed the line with a tax collector and had supper with him, and that was a no-no. That was a cultural no-no for God's people. Now, Jesus doesn't just cross a line here, but he gets personal with her. I wonder this morning, what is your Samaria? What is the line that you say, well, I don't associate with those people? Is it, is it a Muslim? Is it the LGBT community? Is it maybe somebody on the other political side that we sort of tolerate, but we're not really getting personal with them? Jesus crosses all those lines because that's what good news does. Good news crosses dividing lines. It crosses racial lines. It crosses political lines. It crosses philosophical lines. And Jesus walks right across it. And not only does he do that, he begins to get personal with her and address her pain. This woman is in pain. It doesn't look like it. Oh, maybe she looked beautiful. Maybe she had on a Rodan and Fields Mary Kay that morning. And she comes to the well in the middle of the day, and there's a reason that she's coming in the middle of the day. And as Jesus is talking to her and says, give me a drink, the woman said to him, uh, you have nothing to draw with. Why are you talking to me? You know that uh, Hebrews don't talk to Samaritan women. And Jesus says in verse 13, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. So she's like, I don't know what you're talking about. Jesus is getting personal here. And as they're talking about this, the woman says, uh, give me this water. I'd love to have it. I'd love, love to have this living water so I wouldn't have to come back to the well again. And Jesus says to her in verse 16, go call your husband and come here. Uh-oh. Jesus knows something, and, and this woman is kind of hoping that in the middle of the day that she won't have to talk about this, because normally women came to the well in the morning, and they came together. It was kind of a community thing, and they came before it was hot. She comes in the middle of the day about noon, and she comes there in the middle of the day so that she won't have to talk to people because she has something to hide. And she's hoping that she can hide underneath the guise of the afternoon sun alone and not have to talk to somebody, but Jesus goes right there. Have you ever noticed that? Does he do that with you? It's kind of the thing you don't want to talk about, and Jesus keeps knocking on your heart and you go, can we talk about that? And Jesus says, go call your husband. And she says, I don't have a husband. And he says, you're right. You actually have had five husbands, and the guy you're living with right now is not your husband. That's pain. Say what you will. Say, well, you know, she's just free. She's just getting to do, uh, live life the way she wants to. But you don't break, have, a, have a broken heart five times and not have an impact on your life. And Jesus goes right there for it. It's like Jesus is saying... In essence, how's that working for you? How's your love life? The question that she's hoping that he won't ask. And, and I think if she would have said, hey, it's actually going awesome. I'm pretty happy. In fact, marriage was just a problem for me. And now that I'm just living with this guy, my life is better than it's ever been. I think we wouldn't be reading about this story right now. And this is just a reminder for us as people of God that if somebody is quote unquote a happy pagan and they're good with life, your mission in the world is not to try to twist their arm and convince them that they aren't happy. The best thing to do is to pray, to sow some seeds and move on and allow God in his sovereign time to begin to work on their heart until they come to that place of recognition that they really do need a savior, that the secular solution is not working. 
But that takes the, the grace of God and the power of the Holy Spirit to work upon a life. So Jesus is, is doing, he's modeling for us what we should do is just to, rather than say, um, you know, God really hates adultery. God is against fornication. Those things are true. But Jesus doesn't do that. He says, how's it going? Go call your husband. And she says, it's actually not working very well. And that's a moment for us that when that happens in people's lives that we can say, can I tell you, can I share with you about what Jesus has done in my life? Can I share with you how God is making sense of the brokenness in my life and the brokenness of this world? And Jesus says, you're going to thirst again if you continue in this path. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. And then what does she do? This is awesome because this is so much I like the conversations that I've had and you've had that when you start talking about Jesus, what do people want to do? This is what she does. She says, oh, I see that you're a prophet. Yeah. You just told me my history. Well, that doesn't happen to us very often. God doesn't give us that sort of insight. But as, as she's talking with her, as he's talking with her, and she says, I, I see that you're a prophet. Verse 20 our fathers worshiped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. What does she do? So Jesus goes personal. What does she do? Divert. Let's head this conversation into some safe territory. In other words, uh, well, you know, some people say uh, that uh, the, the earth is actually 5,000 years old, and other people say it's like millions of years old. What do you say? Or we, we dig into questions. We say, uh, let me tell you about Jesus, and somebody says, well, you know, there are a lot of priests and pastors that are hypocrites, and they've, they fall, and they, man, you guys have got a lot of internal problems. Or somebody says, um, well, aren't there many ways to God? And those are legitimate questions. And what Jesus does, he doesn't ignore the question, but he gets back to his main subject. And this happens to us when we share our faith sometimes is that people raise those kinds of questions. And what Jesus shows us is how that we ought to redirect the, the question right back to the main point, which is, tell me what you think about Jesus. Do you believe that he rose from the dead? Do you believe he died on the cross? What do you think about the thing that, you know, that God died on a cross, his son? Do you believe that? Tell me what you think about that. And whereas many people will want to direct to those other kinds of questions, but my friends, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, it doesn't matter how old or how young the earth is. That's the big thing. If Jesus didn't die on the cross for us, it doesn't matter about all those other things. And what Jesus does is he gets this woman back to the point. He says, believe me, verse 21, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. What is he saying? He's saying that God wants a personal relationship with you. This is the big point. Those other things are important, but compared to that, uh, this, this is like off the chain that God wants to have a personal relationship with every person. And if you're sitting here today and you're wrestling between those questions about, uh, well, aren't there errors in the Bible? And how old is the earth? And how did Jesus, uh, how was he fully God and fully man? Uh, let's just remember the main thing, which is that God wants a personal relationship with you. He wants to know you. He wants to walk with you. So the woman, she's saying, uh, 
I'd really like this water that you're talking about. She's focused on well water and Jesus is focused on this. And what Jesus is going to do, he's going to paint this picture of something that you can have on the inside that is so much better than anything that the world has to offer. It's like when you're really, really thirsty on a hot day, you don't need crystal light. You need a big glass of ice water. You don't need fake spring water. You don't need the kind of bottled water that somebody's got a a water hose in their backyard filling up bottles. And Jesus says, I want want to give this to you that will be be like a, a well within you. I want, to, I want us to look back at verse 10 and see what Jesus says. This is how he opens his conversation. He says, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that was talking to you. So he's saying, this is the main point, is that God wants to give you something on the inside that's like a, a well of living water. In other words, it's about the generosity of God. My friends, what we have to share and what God has given us to share is not about all the do's and don'ts primarily. It's about a God who is so generous in forgiveness and peace and love and joy and this ever abounding uh, life in the spirit that he wants to put in your heart. That's what this is about. That's why it's good news. And so as this woman is hearing about this, And Jesus is saying, look, God wants a personal relationship with you. The woman says in verse 25, I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. And Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. So it's like, it's all out now. The main point is that I'm here, I'm here to rescue you. You thought you were coming to get some water in the middle of the day, I'm gonna give you more than you ask for. I'm gonna fill the emptiness in your heart. And what's so cool and awesome is this woman is so excited that it tells us that she left her water jar in verse 28, And went away into town and said to the people, come see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? So she becomes a person of faith and becomes a witness to the the grace of God, the generosity of God, and leaves her water jar. This is This is awesome because she is so pumped that this is what you do when you see something beautiful, when you taste something wonderful, is that you almost forget where you were and what you were doing and you just like run to tell somebody. You know that you don't have to, you don't have to make someone tell you something that they're really pumped about. It's like, it's like if you go to In-N-Out Burger and you get one of those awesome burgers, they don't have them in St. Louis. And there's a line of cars when you go to these In-N-Out burgers in California and Arizona that wraps around the street. You don't have to tell somebody that that's awesome because there's a line waiting to get in to get there. And this this is the way it is when something is awesome and beautiful is that we just naturally talk about it. We naturally tell about it. And it isn't manipulation, it's rather just saying, let me tell you about something beautiful and awesome and so lovely and so tasty that you will want some of what I have. But what the world doesn't realize is that while they're tasting these things that seem like they fill the gap and fill the emptiness in their soul at the same time it's eating out their soul. George Orwell describes this, writes this essay and he talks about this wasp that was sitting on his plate. He says, while that wasp was sitting there eating some jam on my plate, I decided I'd do something kind of 
morbid and I cut him in half. And while that wasp was sitting there, it continued to eat the jam while the jam was trickling out its esophagus, continued to eat and didn't realize what had happened until it tried to fly away. And this is the way it is with us apart from God. We're tasting these things that seem like pleasure. And we think that we'll fill our soul. And all the time, it's actually eating us alive. And we don't realize until we try to escape it. Until we try to fly away. Until we try to actually carry on with life. When we realize our soul has been eaten out. And why is he the Messiah? Why is he the Savior? It's because Jesus says, I want you to taste this. I want you to drink of this water. And instead of eating your soul out, it's actually going to become like a well of living water within you. It's going to spill over. It's going to fill your life. And why is he the Messiah? It's because Jesus drank the worst He drank the sin, he drank the power of sin, and before he went to the cross, he prayed to the Father and said, Father, if it's possible, can we kind of get around this cup? But Hebrews chapter 2 verse 9 tells us that he tasted of death for everyone, that Jesus drank the worst of life. He drank the dregs. He drank the stuff that would try to eat your soul alive and try to kill you and leave you empty, that Jesus drank that and he overcame it so that he could give to you and to me this well of living water within us that will never run dry, that will satisfy our soul. And what's at stake? Why does this matter, my friends? Why does it matter this morning that you and I would actually go public with our faith? Why does it matter that we should share what's, what God has done for us, the generosity of God? It's because this really matters. This moment matters, my friend. This moment right here, when we're talking about is it important to share our faith as, as Jesus' followers, It's important because no matter what people are good at, whether it's nursing or teaching children or bank industry and and your work matters to God and God cares about that. But while we're talking this morning, uh, people are being eaten out on the inside thinking that what they're chasing is going to fill their soul. And Jesus is saying, why don't you come to me? And I will be within you a well of living water, and I will satisfy you. There's so much more at stake, my friends, than whether our borders are safe, and who's going to win the election, and will there be World War III, and what about heroin, and what about marijuana, and all those things that that are important, but so much more important when it comes to eternity. We're not just trying to create a better neighborhood. We're not just trying to be nicer people. We're trying to rescue a world. We're trying to rescue friends and neighbors and coworkers and family who are like that severed wasp and they need a savior. And we've been to the well and Jesus has filled our soul. Why wouldn't we talk about it? So I'm challenging myself this morning, as well as you, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, who's your one? Who's one person that this year you can say, God, I'm believing for at least one person to turn to Christ. And I'm going to do all I can just in praying and looking for those God opportunities to share faith, to talk about Jesus, and to keep Jesus the main thing. 
and try not to get off onto the peripheral issues and those questionable things that even people of faith disagree over, but try to keep it back to the main point, which is God wants to know you, and God loves you, and God wants to forgive you. Is anybody glad that when Jesus got a hold of your life, he says, you know, all this stuff in your past, I'm going to act like it never happened. I'm going to actually cleanse you from your past. And I'm, I'm going to make you have joy in the inside. It's not like you're not going to have trouble anymore. Amen, Christians? Anybody have any trouble this week? Anybody have a trouble this morning? <laughs> but in the midst of that, there is this peace, there is this reason to live that even in our suffering, we can say, you know, I don't understand it. And the, and the people can look at us and how do they do that? How do they walk through that and still have this peace of mind? It's Jesus, man. He gives me a reason for living. And I look at the world and I go, man, it is crazy. It is going crazy, but you know what? God is in control. And Jesus has given me this peace and this joy in my life. Now, I, I want to ask that you, as we close today, that if you're a follower of Jesus, would you do something with me this morning? I want you to take 60 seconds, and I want you to ask the Lord, who are potentially three thirsty people in my life. I want you to get either your phone or something to write it down. Maybe it's just inside of your Bible. I'm going to do this today. I want my wife to do it. I want every Christian to do it. But you just pray right now. Yes, Lord, who is a potentially thirsty person? And I'd like to challenge you that you not think about your family members right now. Because here's the reality. Most of us who have family members that don't know Jesus, they've heard us talk about it and talk about it and talk about it. And they aren't listening anymore. What we need to do is pray for other Christians that are not family members to come around them and say the same thing. Will you take 60 seconds with me and pray right now? If you're a follower of Jesus, Lord, I pray this morning. Lord, because... We feel so inadequate. We feel insufficient in our testimony. And God, we we feel that tension. We don't want to be someone who manipulates others. And we want to be authentic and real. God, I pray that you place upon our hearts and minds three people that we can tell about the goodness of God the generosity of God how you want to rescue people you want a personal relationship with people speak to us Lord right now we believe that your work around us could be a neighbor co-worker a friend we've known for a long time maybe a new friend and you've been working on them and, and they're starting to realize that they don't have the solution and we have the water of life. God, give us courage in these days to share. In Jesus' name, amen.